Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. I think a lot of us are intrigued by what goes on at Davos uh, with this big uh, World Economic Forum every year. And and someone who I've uh, had the pleasure of interviewing before, uh, Sharina Hussein, who is a global thought leader in infrastructure. She's a lawyer. She's advisor in new partnerships and financial models. And she runs an organization called Academic Collaboration Consulting, uh, was at Davos. Uh, she posted about it. And so I thought it'd be interesting to, to check in with her and find out, you know, how were the parties, how was the skiing, and and more importantly, what was going on at uh, at the forum uh, itself. Sharina, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me back. Thank you for uh, joining us. So you were at Davos. Uh, let, just give us a little bit of a, a, a an overview uh, of the logistics uh, for a second, if you could. Uh, it's a ski mountain, ski town. Um, where do you fly into and where do you stay? And and is there nonstop parties or, or or what's the sort of environment that you're that you're thrust into when one goes to Davos? Well, Davos is not an easy journey, don't get me wrong. And I say this because I was flying in from uh, Canada into Switzerland, which for the most part, if anyone's ever tried to get to the, the small town of Davos, uh, you can't get there directly. So you either have to fly into a major airport, whether it's Zurich, whether Geneva, and then navigate your way to Davos. And yes, it's, it's surrounded by the most beautiful mountains that you can come across in that area. So it is quite picturesque, but to get there does require a lot of pre planning. Um, we were fortunate to take some of the most scenic uh, trains um, into Davos. It did take some time, upwards of three hours uh, from the major airport. But all in all, it is quite a trek to go from a major international airport into one of those small towns like Davos and then being able to be immersed in what is otherwise a global experience whereby individuals aren't just there for skiing, but also to collaborate form new business partnerships, um, recap over breakfast, lunch, and dinners, and otherwise try to then make sense of what's going on in our own pockets of the world on a global stage, again, in a very scenic, picturesque place in Switzerland. Now, we've uh, spoken previously about your interest in infrastructure uh, and, uh, and and infrastructure and uh, and transit and, and other, uh, you know, other issues must have been um, one of the topics that you were there about. Tell me what 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 you were what were you discussing with people? What were you trying to implement? Uh, something about new partnerships, I understand. Yes. And the, one of the major themes that came with uh, Davos for this year was to try to find collaboration in an increasingly fragmented and a global landscape that is at a, more or less a turning point. And the idea is rethinking who needs to be involved in introducing new types of infrastructure, but also infrastructure that can then facilitate a lot of our global goals. And whether it's the sustainable development goals that the UN has championed or more domestic goals, but different countries have in place, the idea of electrifying or getting to net zero ultimately requires, yes, new technologies, yes, different, say, manufacturers to rethink their processes, but increasingly it requires infrastructure to be in place. In some cases, it isn't the traditional infrastructure that you and I think about when we're considering, say, introducing new transformers or enhancing the grid and introducing things like renewable energy, but rather it's rethinking who are in fact the suppliers of capital, who should be the promoters of those projects, what will in fact be the return for individuals and corporations to be involved in some of those partnerships. So my goal at Davos was to work at how do we introduce new collaboration models in order to introduce that type of infrastructure. New collaboration model. So you're talking about what? Things like the Canadian Infrastructure Bank or, or, or what? Really good question. So there were different governments that were invited to Davos in order to talk about what they're doing and how to get feedback on what are their um, mechanisms to support things like infrastructure. In fact, there were several panels that were quite heated because um, – one of the key considerations that come with, say, our traditional uh, partnership models by national infrastructure banks, not just in Canada, but around the world, is increasingly, what is their role? How do they help facilitate different types of infrastructure? Is it the traditional models where they're the designer and project developers for different types of infrastructure? 
Or do they work with different private sector and community organizations that are otherwise incubating and developing some of these infrastructure projects and then come in to support, say, regulatory approvals, but also offering low cost capital, whether at zero percent interest rates, grants, or even something a bit higher as a way to get some of these projects off the ground when some things like new technologies are things that traditional lenders are just not interested in taking that risk on so early in, say, an infrastructure project's evolution. So those are examples of how to rethink what are the roles of different parties. And it does require a, a big rethinking amongst different government officials, some of whom were there in order to then um, be part of some of those candid conversations about how we go about doing this. Why, why new thinking? Is it just because governments used to just do it themselves and, and now you're suggesting some sort of uh, public-private partnership that that you think is more effective than just governments doing it themselves? Well, that's what a really interesting comment because if we go back far enough, for the most part, governments were the ones building the infrastructure. It was a period in time in which, mostly in the post-war period in Western dem democracies, in which case we began to see governments taking the lead and being the ones to introduce that infrastructure. But if we go back far enough, whether it's driven by private enterprise or even today, if we look at some, say, initiated port projects or different renewable um, energy developments, in most cases, they're being spearheaded by different private parties, and they're working within a government framework, sometimes with a government backstop, say, like, say, being the purchaser of the off-taker of that power, or another way, just being an approver of some of these projects involved. So that's where, when we think about what's needed for, say, um, mass uh, charging infrastructure across an entire continent, um, relying upon a government promoter to then introduce that electricity infrastructure heavily requires utilities, some of which are privately owned and operated. So that's where you have to start rethinking who should be involved in some of those projects, what are their interests, and can there be a way to align those incentives? And looking at electric vehicles in that transition was one of the hot topics at Davos because so many different private sector organizations are all being affected by some of the targets that their governments have put forward, whether it's net zero by 2030, 2035, and onwards, it does require decisions to be made now, in particular infrastructure decisions to make that happen. Uh, fascinating. Sounds uh, like an interesting uh, time that you spent at uh, Davos. We're going to take a break for some messages. Uh, we'll be back in two minutes with uh, Sharina Hussein talking a little bit about uh, Davos, about partnerships, about infrastructure, about the economy, about what uh, what the world leaders that uh, were at uh, the World Economic Forum this year were, were discussing. Stay with us, everyone. Back in two minutes. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. My guest tonight is uh, Sharina Hussein. She is uh, the uh, founder and, uh, and and organizer of a consulting company called Academic Collaboration Consulting. Really quite an interesting name, Academic Collaboration uh, Consulting. She's a lawyer, an infrastructure lawyer. She's an advisor on new partnerships and sustainable uh, finance models. And, and, and Sharina, you know, I'm interested that uh, your featured post – is a picture of you in front of a U.S. Capitol, I guess, and you say, we are in the midst of an infrastructure moment. Tell me, why are we in the midst of an infrastructure moment? Well, this is where if we stop and think about key milestones in how our governments, economies, our societies are otherwise uh, – categorized over time. Usually it's fragmented, but then there's a theme. And those themes I like to call as being moments, in which case there's a unique mobilization of different values, of different stakeholders, but also about different actions that collide to then create momentum for the next few years, if not decades. And that otherwise has a big impact on how our societies evolve. In terms of that post and looking at the infrastructure moments, I was referring to the unique mobilization in the United States to support infrastructure. More specifically, notwithstanding the fragmentation amongst political parties, the ability for different um, 
lead politicians as well as backed by industry to come to a consensus that for the U.S. economy and increasingly countries like Canada, which is heavily tied to uh, the momentum in the U.S., needs to reposition itself in order to succeed in the next decade and beyond. One of the key drivers for that unique alignment relates to the need to then invest in sustainable infrastructure but also to create localized supply chain, upskill significant segments of the U.S. population, as well as incubate new technologies based in the United States and potentially across North America as a way to help the U.S. economy succeed for the next decades to come. And we can look at how the U.S. is performing relative to other major economies, whether it's geopolitical risks or if it's just looking at things like um, electrification and how the U.S. lags significantly behind major large economies. This unique alignment that has occurred has spearheaded a lot of different activities, whether it's in forms of grants and tax incentives, but also with some of the major um, manufacturing service providers within the U.S. to come to an alignment that this is going to happen and they need to start repositioning now. So when you ask me about what, what exactly does this infrastructure moment mean, it means it's the groundbreaking analysis that this is where so much of the country needs to go in the next few years and a unique agreement that comes into play that we all have um, some form of responsibility and support to make that happen. We're only now beginning to see the uh, Canadian economy and Canadian decision makers as well identify just how significant that moment has been in terms of the relocation of manufacturing facilities, the, the real segment of capital coming into the United States in relation to this, and the need ultimately for Canada to be able to be part of that momentum as well. So, you know, I think it's a fascinating conversation. I was at a conference recently where they were talking about how electrification, electric cars are going to change things uh, uh, um, in our towns, in our cities, uh, along our highways, and that uh, you know every major intersection has got uh, two or three or four uh, gas stations. Um, we don't have uh, the charging stations. We need to have those charging stations that if everyone uh, gets uh, electric cars that we think are getting electric cars, uh, that uh, we got nowhere near enough uh, generating capacity, uh, um, uh, power grid capacity, et cetera, to get the electricity from wherever it is uh, to uh, to those uh, generating stations and, and then to those uh, um, uh, recharging stations that need to need to occur. Um, and that there's a whole bunch of people that currently employed in the oil and gas sector that are going to go through a fairly significant uh, transition. You said that this was uh, subject to some heated conversations at Davos. Tell me a little bit about what you think some of the issues are as we go through this energy transition. Well, in terms of it being um, a moment and the recognition that this is where we're going to go, there isn't consensus, however, in terms of how we go about doing this. So this is where this idea of this being a transition towards low carbon or zero emission, um, say, transport, is one in which there's so many different pathways available. And you identified one of the key challenges we have just here in the Greater Toronto area in terms of where exactly do you go to recharge, how long will it take to recharge, how much do you pay? And also, if you ask anyone who's been, say, an early adopter, they realize that they may maybe need two or three apps on their phone in order to schedule, identify, and in fact, pay for the electricity needed for that. So there's a lot of growing pains with respect to one of the pathways we see right now. One of, however, the key elements um, that's quite heated is in relation to where is where, what role does oil and gas play and those organizations and those workers play in this transition? And increasingly, we've been hearing a lot about the role of hydrogen and how different forms of, say, green, blue hydrogen can be a temporary solution to help us fill the gap in relation to moving from internal combustion engines to those that have a lower carbon profile. You'll note, however, Brian, that a lot of people take this very personally in terms of, well, a hydrogen or natural gas-powered transport isn't low carbon. It has carbon at the tailpipe. It's, it's not good enough. But it is an example of how 
we have to look and examine what are different pathways available. An excellent example of how this is really problematic, or I would put another way, I'm an optimist, so I like to look at it as being an opportunity, comes with some of our heavy duty transport. And places like the GTA has some of the largest throughput of heavy duty vehicles that come through our pathways in order to supply product across the continent. Relying upon the current battery technology to then make a haul that could be from places like, um, you know, Toronto, all the way down to California, is one in which it requires a lot of different charging ports. And that's where some of the arguments are put forward for different types of technologies and propulsion technologies specifically, like compressed or renewable natural gas, like hydrogen, et cetera. And it's in that conversation about being pragmatic and identifying the end user needs is where you're going to see a lot of different partnership um, uh, models emerge and different rules for those oil and gas companies to otherwise transform themselves in order to supply into those niches, which traditionally one propulsion technology is just not enough. And you mentioned a really good point too about what about our grid? Is there enough electricity to ultimately power uh, that money vehicles plugging at the same time? And that's where it's also, um, I would say, a systems infrastructure challenge as well. What kind of energy do you need to generate? What is the role of different technologies to moderate how we charge? Are there new battery chemistries, for example, that are coming online? As well as looking at, are there unique roles for utilities in different uh, modulized storage and microgrids to then facilitate this? These are just some of the conversations that were happening at Davos and beyond because there are different organizations and startups working in all these spaces. Now it's a question of how do we align them in a right way to then start this transition in different places around the world. Now, you said there were heated discussions. So what were the different points of view? So if we were to say, look at um, a technology like hydrogen, many have said that they've tried this technology. It's been around for 60 years. No one's quite adopted. Is it really low emitting? We're waiting to see something come to market that is actually commercializable and scalable. Recognizing, of course, that some of the hydrogen infrastructure is very expensive. It's difficult to transport, and we haven't quite gotten the scale needed for it to have any form of economic payback in many places. On the other side of the equation, we in fact see um, different types of organizations, some as large and well-established uh, automobile manufacturers that are very bullish on hydrogen, so much so that if you were to go to places in Los Angeles, you'll see hydrogen fueling stations right next to your traditional gas pump. In which case, there are lineups of different hydrogen propulsion or hydrogen fuel cell vehicles waiting to refuel there. So it does become a question of yes, there is some form of user demand. Yes, there are some vehicle manufacturers that see a future in that. But of course, it becomes a broader question of is this something that can be um, a solution for? all different stakeholders and use cases? And the answer is no, it's unique. It depends upon those needs. But to be able to have that conversation identifying who and where hydrogen exists, that's where some of those heated conversations have left some saying, well, no, this is not gonna happen versus show me a bankable project and then I'll put my money behind it and see it take root in places like Canada. Well, I think the challenge is you got to have someone that's got the the guts uh, and the money, uh, like Elon Musk, to really make a, an industry out of something. Uh, you know, streetcars around North America were running on ammonia, which is sort of like hydrogen back in the 1920s. And, uh, and both hydrogen and ammonia do not have any carbon uh, in them. And so therefore they don't emit uh, carbon when uh, burnt and you can burn them in, in something pretty similar to an internal combustion engine. Uh, and so aren't those potential solutions? They are potential solutions. And what we also saw at Davos was the rest of the world coming to um, the table and being able to demonstrate what they're doing. So uh, as just as an example, India is the president of the G20 this year, and they had a significant presence at Davos, so much so that you really saw uh, many delegates as well as different um, exhibitions or houses that went about and demonstrated what leadership that India has in certain segments. They recently announced that they're very bullish on green hydrogen. 
And the question now becomes, well, is that just a made in India solution or is it something that could be exported in different places? And what was really unique in those conversations was the growth of different segments, whether it's in farming and agricultural equipment, whether it's in mining or different port operations, in which case it's not just hydrogen, but it's also uh, some of the lower carbon emitting fuels like uh, natural gas that are all part of the equation. So then look at Yes, it's lower carbon than where we were before. It's not the ideal solution, but we're getting there as a way then to scale their technology. And in a market that's growing as quickly like India, that is a significant impact in terms of their overall carbon profile. So my understanding is that uh, blue hydrogen comes from uh, from hydrocarbons, but green hi uh, hydrogen comes from electricity. And uh, And so whether... It's electrical cars and uh, and and uh, and and recharging stations or green hydrogen. We're going to need a heck of a lot of more electrical generating capacity. How do we do that? Is is that again hydrocarbons that we're going to be burning natural gas or or something else in in uh, in uh, in uh, in generating stations or more nuclear power or more hydro dams? What's the solution there? The short answer is that there isn't one solution that comes into play. It is very much a solution based upon where you are and the alignment of different uh, interests and existing infrastructure. Um, something that has been percolating for some time, like irrespective of Davos, has been looking at ways to then generate um, enough electricity from not only renewable energy and the traditional sources like solar or wind farms, but also looking at things like uh, food waste or other ways to then have a circular economy perspective of um, generating that electricity, but the overall impact will be quite neg uh, low or negligible. I can't say that we're there yet, only because there's a lot of unique technologies at play and the scalability and transferably a, a transferability across different places is still yet to be seen. But I would say at this point, there is a lot of brilliant minds, a lot of capital, but also a lot of different government interests that are trying to then incubate different ways to avoid generating electricity from our traditional sources, at least as a way to manage the grid um, demand that comes with the, the ultimate growth in electricity for all these different needs. I'm personally convinced that one of the solutions, if not, frankly, uh, a critical backbone solution to all of these things that you're talking about is nuclear power. Uh, and nuclear power was uh, was really dismissed uh, by environmentalists for a long period of time. But I think more and more people are becoming aware that nuclear power is key to uh, us going to a, a green economy and to a low carbon economy. Was there any conversation about nuclear at Davos? There was some conversations, but for the most part, it wasn't, at least from, from my vantage point, it wasn't the bulk of the conversations. Um, but however, if you look at the Canadian context and being able to modulize some of our nuclear reactors and doing so in unique partnership models, including the government, um, does introduce some unique interests from around the world to understand how that could potentially be replicated in different countries, in which case nuclear does appear to be part of the solution set. But the way to do so in a way that is not only bankable, has the agreement of uh, residents in that area, but also has a talent pool who understands nuclear and how to manage some of those facilities is also a big gap that we're looking to fill because many of those uh, technical minded individuals who are involved in the nuclear industry have since retired. And there hasn't been a significant interest in going to university and being trained for this, uh, even at the college level anymore. But it could very well be the beginning of a rethink on the upskilling exercise. You used the word modularize. What, what do you mean by modularize uh, the nuclear industry? So that's the opportunity to then, as opposed to having a very large facilities that have to generate a specific output, is then being instead um, something that is, if I could call it right-sized, and being able to have a, a more sizable impact, but not necessarily requiring the significant capital commitment in doing so. Um, I believe the Canada Infrastructure Bank has put some capital towards um, some modulized reactors here in Canada. So that's probably worth looking uh, forward to just to understand what that would look like um, and possibly scalable, scalable around the world too. We're chatting tonight with uh, Sharina Hussein, who is uh, 
uh, a recent uh, attendee at uh, Davos. Uh, she's a lawyer. She's an infrastructure specialist. She's a collaboration expert. We're going to take a break for some messages and come back uh, in just two minutes with Shreena. We're going to talk a little bit about the economy and, uh, and, and, uh, and what else was going on at Davos. Stay with us, everyone. Interesting conversation tonight. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. My guest tonight is Sharina Hussein, who is a lawyer. She's an infrastructure expert. She's a collaboration expert. She's a professor. She runs something called the Academic uh, Collaboration Consulting, uh, and uh, and she's a really smart individual. She recently attended uh, Davos, and uh, we've been chatting a little bit about uh, Davos and uh, and some of the topics in regards to uh, to uh, electrification of our grid, about to recharging stations of electrical cars, electrical vehicles, and some of these new funding uh, um, collaboration uh, partnerships, I guess, that uh, the that, that models that, uh, that you think uh, are required. Um, what else was being talked about? You know, undoubtedly, the economy, inflation, interest rates, uh, uh, potential for a recession must have been a topic uh, at Davos. Uh, were you attending any of those uh, sessions? And 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 if so, sort of what what did you hear people uh, from either government or business talk about in that regard? What was really interesting in terms of the agenda and the conversations that were happening at Davos was the recognition that there are some short term um, themes and challenges that business leaders from around the world have to tackle. And then there's more the longer term in terms of looking at how we can then work together in order to address some of the um, challenging problems or objectives that we have for ourselves. In terms of the short term issues, whether it's in terms of looking at inflationary impact, potentially slowing growth patterns and uh, retirements in different core markets so much so that there may be labor shortages was a key theme that populated um, several talks. And in that regard, the themes and the takeaways from those conversations were focused on, first and foremost, what does the future of the workforce look like? How do we incentivize um, workers to stay along? Um, what does hybrid working even look like in today's day and age, and how will that evolve? in the next few years. And one of the key takeaways from those conversations was that I would say the tension between productivity with being able to work from anywhere, paired with the recognition that many organizations are quite entrenched in some of their values and how we assess whether someone is doing the work that was attested to, um, how do we evaluate performance and then uh, promote accordingly. So in many cases, Brian, we've more or less talked about this since the pandemic took hold in 2020 and what the future of work looks like. At Davos, it was then an evolution of some of those talking points and looking at how different organizations are trying to retain and incentivize some of their workers recognizing that this is more or less a trend that's here to stay. This, of course, was in the backdrop of major um, corporations, particularly those in a tech center, sector, announcing specific layoffs um, in tandem with what was happening. So it does. It was also a tense instance, but also it was a question of, well, if we are able to retain talent, how do we do so and how will we keep them incentivized through what is otherwise a period of slowing growth? Some said the R word recession, others did not, but it did become a question of where do workers fit in the equation and how do you keep them as being partners through this period? On the other end of the equation, on the more of the long term, the role of technologies and um, automation was also a theme that came forward. And during this period, of course, Microsoft came out publicly and they said that they're very interested in some of the um, very exciting and also trend worthy um, AI platforms like ChatGDT. In which case, um, it's the opportunity to then mimic someone on the other side with very elaborate language skills, but otherwise utilizing different forms of algorithms to push out a specific answer to a prompt that someone would offer. In that regard, it wasn't necessarily the future of workers, but also the future of organizations that can leverage this type of AI in a way that achieves their organizational objectives, but also in a way that addresses many of the gray areas that comes with AI in this format, whether it's the accuracy of what is being pushed forward, whether it's equitable, and how to manage the potential impact that 
that might have on organizations and, again, the global workforce that might have to be reskilled or change their skill set, recognizing that these types of technologies will supplement the type of work that they'll be doing. I got to tell you, we could do a whole show on uh, AI and uh, chat, uh, whatever it's called, uh, GTB or something like that. Uh, it's become uh, something that everyone has uh, been talking about. But let's stay uh, with uh, the shorter term just for a second. Uh, you say that some people talked about the R word recession and some people did not. What's the sense of uh, of business leaders and government leaders at Davos? Are we headed to uh, to a, a recession in, in 2023? Well, the consensus is that there will be areas in which it will will experience slowdowns. Um, the degree of that slowdown, as well as its length, is where there's a lot of debate amongst. Well, how how then these these organizations will position themselves? Some are seeing just a slowdown by two or three percent in their operations. Others are seeing that um, it's just going to be a blip in the radar because they're taking actionable steps today to do things like reduce their fixed cost or scale back on the investment that they're going to make today in order to weather the storm that might come forward. So in that regard, are we in a recession? How long that recession will be and how deep it will ultimately be on an organization and their workforce were areas in which case you really didn't get a consensus in any room. If, uh, if we do have a recession, I think it's going to be triggered by the increase in interest rates. And this increase in interest rates is uh, is is there because of, uh, of uh, higher inflation. And the higher inflation is really a cause of government because of the, the money that they spent uh, uh, during um, the pandemic that may have lasted too long and, and been overspent that led to this inflationary environment. Was there any talk about about that? And, and you know, it's it's kind of weird to have a a recession caused by government that now government's trying to solve. There was some concern about that and what would be the appropriate role of government as a way to then navigate the current situations that we're in. Um, some of the unique conversation and viewpoints that occurred in that realm were in fact from different types of capital deployers or investors who are now placed in a situation whereby they have to rethink their portfolios. It was an instance whereby for you know, upwards of a decade and being spurred by the past two years, there were historic lows in interest rates, which otherwise meant that they had to reposition their portfolio in a way that took into account or almost compensated for that as a way to then make sure that pensioners were able to get um, their, their promised beneficiary payout or life insurance companies or even just uh, general investors who are in the context of a fund. Skip now to 2023, in which case, um, being able to navigate what's happening in the stock market, how bond and treasury yields are adjusting, as well as how to invest in alternatives, whether it's in uh, private companies, um, real estate infrastructure, alternatives, it becomes a big unknown for many of those capital providers, in which case, from their vantage point, um, there are camps that are just trying to sit it out and wait to understand how the cards fold. And then there's others that are looking at how do we look past the current current volatility and start investing in the longer term. So looking past what could be a period of elevated interest rates, but seeking growth in um, new technologies and new markets that can then drive uh, the next uh, period into 2030 and beyond. So that's where you see a lot of those conversations. And unfortunately, again, no consensus as it relates to where do we go from here? We had uh, new Basel uh, banking obligations uh, put in place just on February the 1st. Uh, we've had uh, increase of interest rates, uh, uh, credit spreads have increased, banks have uh, become less uh, willing to lend. Was there any conversation about the banking industry and how that uh, those changes are going to impact industry? There were. Um, to be honest, I wasn't all that in-depth in some of those conversations, but the most part uh, or the large themes that came out of that was, well, this change is going to happen. We have to position ourselves for this change. And ultimately, the sense of being a bit more conservative in this environment, waiting to see how some of these changes take hold. Um, and then taking one step further, how those organizations will then monitor that change in, say, per, uh, account performance before making any decisions about how they want to reposition themselves. This uh, topic about automation and uh, and AI and its impact on jobs. I was at a, 
a session, uh, you know, maybe a year or two ago where they were saying that, you know, entry level auditors, entry level lawyers, uh, uh, truck drivers, all all of those things could be automated in the future. What what what's going to be the impact of automation of AI on uh, the workforce, particularly those entry level jobs that, you know, people need to get their their career started? Excellent question. And this this is an area where I have my personal beliefs in the research that I've been doing versus what is otherwise identified in um, a lot of global narratives about this. Yes, there is the, the unique possibility that jobs will be lost, but at the same time, I would argue that these jobs will evolve. And when they, what I mean evolve is that if you ever were to say utilize any AI platform like you know chat GBT, you realize that there's a degree of discretion that has to be taken with that output. There is still a need to identify, well, what is the prompt that I'm introducing and what do I do with that output? So there's still a role for human interaction. And that's where the skill sets that would be involved wouldn't necessarily be input driven, but rather needing to exercise a degree of different skill sets like critical thinking, problem solving, interpersonal skills increasingly, those are skills that are not easily replicable by AI in many of those positions. But what it does mean is that for individuals who are, say, um, looking to enter the workforce or now looking at their career and see potentially the impact that AI could have, it's important for them to rethink their skill sets and how then to enhance, polish, or even promote the skills that they do have that is, isn't easily cannibalized by AI, if I could put it that way. So a good example would be um, interpersonal skills, EQ. Those aspects are becoming even more valuable today than they ever have. So being able to identify that, that uh, unique coordination between new positions, the needs for workers today, and how that work in sync with the degree of automation that's coming forward is a unique opportunity set. And that goes all the way down to how we, how we learn how we t were teaching uh, children in school in order to then evolve that skill set. So when you're ready to enter the workforce, you're not necessarily in competition with that automation and its impact in different industries. You know, that's fascinating. I, uh, I think there's been this big focus uh, on STEM uh, education, science, technology, engineering, math of late. And, uh, and then I read this article that suggested that because of this interpersonal skills, this critical thinking, et cetera, that maybe people have got to make sure that they have a couple of arts programs and, uh, and, and, and English and, and, uh, and, uh, and, you know, almost back to the old uh, uh, adage of being able to speak and speak well and make arguments, et cetera. So do you think education needs to change in this uh, environment of, uh, of the need for critical thinking? Yes, it does. And we're seeing the impact of not evolving our education system today when we look at um, the ability to assess what is fake news, as people call it, or being able to think twice about what you're reading to assess, is this right? Is this true? Are there any questions I have to ask about it in order to uh, rely upon this piece of information? So the need for rethinking education exists today, even before we look onwards to um, the impact of automation. So I agree with you 100% on that. Hmm. What else uh, were some of the interesting topics that uh, were top of mind that you attended that uh, were buzzing around the, the halls at uh, Davos this year? Well, there's a really uh, set of conversations about um, the role of youth and what does the, the future of the world um, what are they looking forward to? How then can decisions be made today to make that um, society, our businesses, our overall quality of life um, attractive and ones in which the youth can thrive in? And that was, I found really interesting because there weren't that many youth in attendance to Davos. As we talked about earlier, it's not easy to get there, um, first of all. And also, if you look at just the composition of who's there, we're for the most part, very senior business leaders in different areas. So being able to introduce youth and the youth voice in and of itself was quite challenging to do so. But I think that's a theme that we're seeing play out in many, I would say, international gatherings of this sort, whether it's through the United Nations, whether it's through certain things like Climate Week or Equality, 
gatherings in that regard is looking at what does the 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 youth of today and their needs and how can we ensure that it's present top of mind and can be addressed issues such as things like housing affordability um, what does job prospects look like climate change and the impact on um, the socioeconomic environment for them were all themes that come out of that but being able to put that into practice um, is also, again, an area where it was TBD. And I suspect we're going to continue to hear these conversations in gatherings um, long after everyone had left Davos. Sharina, you've got just such a fascinating background. You know, you've got uh, uh, an undergraduate business degree. You've got a graduate business degree. You've got a doctor of philosophy in infrastructure, financing and development. And, you uh, and you've got a uh, a law degree. What what drove you to get this incredibly uh, wide educational experience in business and financing and in law? Well, that's that's probably a topic for another show, Brian, because it's a, it's a long story. But if I were just to summarize that, I would say it was very much out of curiosity paired with a reaction to market conditions. I unfortunately graduated out of the recession of 2008, which ultimately required a rethinking of no one's hiring. What do I do? I have a lot of mounting student debt. So that otherwise prompted some of my decisions. And then looking at uh, advancing higher education through um, a PhD, it was a question, of course, of I'm doing a lot of great work in the infrastructure space, great partnership, public-private partnership models, but there are areas that can be improved. And I saw that. So again, that is an instance of the curiosity of how can I um, research and come up with solutions in order to put this in practice and improve either the situation or avoid some of the pitfalls that could potentially happen based upon what we're doing. And that's why um, a lot of the research and the collaborations that I do through academic collaboration consulting exists. And the name pretty much says it all. It's being able to utilize some of those unique insights and leading edge research from our teams in order to then um, craft that and deploy it across different industries like an infrastructure in order to develop some unique partnership and related solutions to address those problems that we've increasingly seen um, pop up. I got to ask you, what was your thesis on? <laughs> um, it was in looking at the role of private capital in the public, the infrastructure, public, private partnership models that we hear, have here in Canada. So one of key elements that comes into that is, are we in fact using private contracts, private finance, private um, decision making to ultimately control our publicly loaned infrastructure in Canada. So it's a very unique thesis because it required me to look at it from the perspective of economic geography, um, financing, private law, as well as urban planning and geography in order to assess how some of the tools and techniques that we use in our um, structuring of infrastructure projects having the impact on changing the nature of control and autonomy over our publicly owned infrastructure. Oh my gosh, that'd be a fascinating topic in of itself. Uh, that'd be uh, really interesting <laughs> to chat about sometime. We're going to take a final break and come back with some concluding comments with uh, Sharina Hussein in just two minutes about her trip this past January to Davos, uh, the World Economic Forum. Stay with us, everyone. Interesting conversation. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. My guest tonight is Sharina Hussein. She's uh, a, uh, an MBA. She's a uh, business person. She's uh, a lawyer. Uh, she's got a PhD in uh, infrastructure finance. Uh, she runs a, an organization called Academic Collaboration Consulting. Uh, and she recently came back from uh, Davos uh, in Switzerland, uh, the World Economic Forum. Sharina, I got to ask you, you know, there's there's this conspiracy theory people that think that the World Economic Forum is trying to take over the world, that Davos is something bad. Uh, Pierre Polyev, the leader of uh, the Conservative Party, says he's not going to allow any of his ministers to go to Davos. Is Davos really trying to take over the world? Is it is it good? Is it bad? Is it evil? Or is it really just a, a really good conference that uh, senior business and government people would go to? <laughs> 
Well, we're at a time in which case there's a lot of scrutiny over the gatherings like Davos. And for the most part, if we go back to the core of why it exists and how it came into being, it's an opportunity for different business leaders from around the world to connect and share their insights. Like, what are they seeing? What are they worried about? And what can be done um, as a way to address some of those challenges, potentially through striking partnerships or joint ventures with one another. So at the heart, that is what uh, Davos is meant to do. Over time, it moved beyond just being private sector oriented to also introduce select um, government officials from different places around the world to speak and participate in some of those conversations. How that comes into being and how those decisions unfold in those different countries ultimately is up to how those relationships and conversations unfold while they're at Davos and even beyond. So that's where some of the controversy that surrounds Davos in today's day and age ultimately comes into being, much because this is a private sector uh, gathering, in which case different publicly um, uh, publicly voted and uh, accountable representatives are attending and being part of that ecosystem comes into play. So is that good that the public and private people interact or is it bad that the public and private people interact? It could be useful if those interactions advance the, the core needs of the different um, countries and their representatives um, that particularly the residents in their home countries. How that goes about happening, of course, becomes a question of, is it transparent? Is there accountability? And is this aligned with how decisions are ultimately made back in one's home country after the fact? And I think that's the gray area that comes into play when we're thinking about you know, who's making decisions at Davos, because ultimately publicly um, voted and accountable representatives do have responsibilities to their constituents. So they have to follow certain processes when it comes to making decisions. If and how that's being respected through their relationships at Davos is ultimately something that might, you know, might occur or might require more transparency. It really depends upon the nature of their interactions at Davos. But they're they're just interactions, right? They're they're conferences, they're speeches, they're 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 networking. That you know, it's in the name of your your company, collaboration, and collaboration should be good. Uh, and so these people that for some reason have got this real fear of uh, government people talking to business people and government people from one area talking to government people from a different country, um, I just don't understand it. Collaboration should be good. Communication should be good. Curiosity should be good. Why is it bad that people are getting together, albeit in a ski town in a in a in a in a beautiful environment, and talking and finding out what is the issues and what works in another environment? What's wrong with that? In in, the, in theory, and what you just described um, shouldn't necessarily be a bad thing. I think one of the key challenges that come into play is how those conversations can translate into decisions and whether or not that is in alignment with the expectations of the constituents that public officials have uh, when they're voted into office and if those decisions are ultimately in the best interest of that country. And ultimately, that honest sits with the, the public official that's attending the conference, having those conversations in order to then navigate that um, that environment. And that could very well be one of the reasons why there is some concern about the nature of decisions made at Davos, because there might not necessarily be the transparency that some of those uh, representatives want to see when they're going into or electing officials who may in fact attend a gathering like Davos. Well, if they make bad decisions uh, after their uh, trip to Davos, they'll get uh, defeated. Arguably, that's how it should work in a, a representative democracy. I would hope that's the way it happens. Uh, Sharina Hussein, thank you so much for joining us and telling us a little bit about your trip to Davos. Uh, uh, a good conversation about some uh, infrastructure funding models and partnerships that uh, need to change and the challenge uh, of that, particularly as we think about a green economy and a, and a low carbon economy, uh, talking a little bit about the economy and uh, recession or, or fears of recession. I, I'm really intrigued by this whole uh, conversation you talk about in regards to uh, changes of employment, uh, given automation and AI and uh, chat GBT or whatever it's called. Uh, and uh, and then also just about uh, whether Davos and collaboration are good or, or something to be concerned about. Thank you for uh, an interesting conversation today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Brian.
That's our show for tonight, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I remind you, I'm on every Monday through Friday at 6 o'clock on 960 AM. You can stream me online, even from Davos at www.saga960am.ca. Good night, everybody.